the stigma that you talk about and the taboo about it and, and the idea that there's something shameful about it, mm -hmm. that's what makes it heavy. It's not right. the thing. It's not depression that's heavy. It's just a word. It's right. the emotion we put to it. Hello, and thank you for joining me here on Hope to Recharge podcast, the podcast that's designed to break the stigma around mental health and to create some hope and inspiration and give some practical tips to those that are struggling with mental health, whether it's from personal stories to break the stigma or some advice from professionals in the mental health community. Whether you are struggling with mental health on your own or you know a loved one that is struggling, we are here to support you and to create a community so you you know you are not alone. The road to recovery can be difficult and challenging. At Hope to Recharge, we believe that in mental health, together is always better. I'm your host, Matana. Thank you for joining me here today. Hello. Today, I have an interesting, interesting guest that's going to share a lot of her journey in mental health. Regina Rosa Celeste. I love the yes. name. And by the way, Regina came up with this name in meditation. She changed her name. It just shows what Regina is because she's a person of choice, taking, taking things, matters into her hand and choosing what feels comfortable for her and what feels right. She's going to share her story soon about how she came to wellness through heavy depression and mental health issues. But I feel like the fact that she chose to actually choose her name and she went, got it through meditation, it just shows how passionate she is about finding who she really is and, and what connects her to who she is and choosing what works for her. You know, we're born into a name, we're born into a last name, we're born into a family. So sometimes we have to choose what works for us. So Regina, it's an honor to have you here with me today. Thank you for joining me here today. Thank you, Munson. I'm so happy to be here and excited to share my journey with your audience. And I'm honored. And this work is so important. So thank you for having the courage to, to speak at in, and bring it to voice, bring it to fruition, because it's really something a lot of people I feel need um, need to start looking at. It's an important subject. Yes. And when we, so we met through the podcast, through a mutual friend for the podcast. And um, Regina was telling me her story of recovery and bravery. And I thought it was really a powerful story. And I wanted to share it with my audience and what she learned from it, where she is today and how she's serving the world what she learned and how she evolved. And basically she decided to pay it forward and to create an environment that helps people heal. Um, she's the founder of Internal Peace Now, which is a place to do practice yoga, meditation, a place of finding your inner peace. So Regina, give us a little bit of a background on where you grew up, what kind of background, when did mental health meet you for the first time? in your life. Absolutely. Again, Matana, thank you so much. It's a, it's a valuable lesson, read lesson that I've learned several times. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate now that I'm speaking about this is because it showed up in my life more than once. And for anyone that might be experiencing what feels like depression or some type of, I literally, this last episode, um, I call it going to hell. Mm. <laughs> it was for me very, very um, real and raw. And I believe it's something that I asked for unconsciously, my soul asked for as a way of transforming into the newer and more uh, aligned version of myself. And the name that you spoke of a few minutes ago, it's interesting because I had a meditation almost 10 years ago. I was in the middle of a meditation. I remember the building and I remember the teacher that I was with and it was short. It was a seven minute meditation with one of my teachers, Jennifer Grace. And um, it was about seeing your, your higher self. And when, when we speak of higher self, you know, we're talking about the part of us. I think I say us because all of us have it. We have this little voice that speaks right. to us and I call it right. our intuition. Right. And um, my intuition was speaking to me then and communicating to me that I was going to go on a journey. And I had as many people do, what I think and, and still think of and thought then was a normal life. I was, you know, working and had family and friends and what most people would say was enough to be happy. And yet there was this part of me that was still really um, longing for more. And I remember waking up and just kind of asking myself, is there more to this? Is this it? 
And then I went through a very deep depression in 2013 and it lasted about nine months. And then um, by the grace of what I call spirit and, and God, I call my higher power, God and universe. Anybody listening can call whatever power they, they associate with mm-hmm. whatever word feels good to them. Um, for me, I didn't ask for help that first time. And so it came back is, is what I believe happened. And it came back stronger and more intense. I got an opportunity to ask myself, well, why is this happening again? Because there were moments and there were days where I literally felt like there was bricks, heavy bricks on top of my body. And I was having a hard time getting out of bed. I remember my mom at the time was going through her own physical challenges. She was going through cancer. And um, I felt so guilty because I thought my mom is, is going through cancer right now and, and chemo. And I'm here complaining because I don't feel good mentally. Mm. And I felt guilty about that, like guilty. Like who am I to have pain? So who am I to suffer? And meanwhile, here I am a yoga teacher and I'm supposed to be teaching and healing people. And so there was this real disconnection between who I wanted to be and who I felt I should I guess who I, who I was in that moment, who I was feeling myself to be and who I thought I should be. And, um, what I found through research and through seeking and actually receiving the help, the second round was that, um, that's part of the disease. That's what happens is the mind in in my experience starts to create so much story and so much inaccurate information that the person going through the experience starts to believe that something's wrong with them. And I felt shame around feeling depressed. Mm -hmm. And I went deeper and deeper into the spiral to the point where, you know, like I was sharing, it was hard for me to get up in the morning and it was hard for me. It didn't matter how much sleep I had. I was sleeping nine, sometimes nine, 10 hour days, which was absurd because I never slept so much. Like people that know me know that I could function on five, six hours, maybe even four hours sometimes of sleep. So it wasn't sleep. It was, I was suffering and I was hurting and the lesson that I got the second time was to, was to really feel it. And I, I felt it like to the depths and I finally reached out for help. Um, I started with a coach who is a friend of mine who's become a very good friend now. And um, I was embarrassed because I thought, who am I to be in this situation when I have parents that are ill? And then there was a circum- you know, whole slew of circumstances that started to get worse. My dad got sick, almost lost his life knock on wood. Thank you, Hashem. Like he's still here. Mm-hmm. And, um, he's become my inspiration. You know, he's also going through his own challenges because he's not in the condition he used to be. And so he every day wakes up and gets to choose like we all do. I believe. Right. Choose. right. For me, the turning point was, and, and it is, it's not, it, it's not just, it was because we, we get to make that choice. I believe every day we wake up. Mm. The choice is who do I want to serve today? How can I serve today? That's the question I started asking. And um, and I know I've shared this with you and I'm, I'm so glad that I remember this because this is really important. For anyone that's going through this or listening, uh, I think the big question that can, or at least I believe, I like to believe can help make a difference is instead of asking, why is this happening to me? Ask why, how, how can this serve me? Mm-hmm. How can this experience serve me? Yeah. Because when I was going through it and, and there's no guarantee that I won't go through it again, you know, right. like suffering and, and unfortunately depression is a lot like what I started to, to believe was it's like having a cold. Like it, it, it's not something that just goes away because you will it to go away. You can't just want it to go away. You have to do the work. You have to do the spiritual work. I believe the mental work, the physical work. And I started doing all that. I first hired a coach. Then I started going to therapy. And then I started, I did obviously a couple other things. Like I started doing exercise and eating different. But when you're, you know, you're on your knees and you're begging for help and then help shows up. I don't know about others, but I know there were moments where I kept saying, no, 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 I don't need it. I don't need it. And yet I was crying for help. Right. So when help shows up, say yes. And tap into it. Tap into it. Exactly. Like you're, you're, 
you know, your um, podcast is help, right? I remember listening to it and that's why I reached out to you because we have a mutual friend and she, I heard was on the podcast and I thought, wait, why is she on here? And when Mm -hmm. I noticed the connection, Mm -hmm. I thought, oh my goodness, this is a much bigger epidemic and problem than I ever imagined. And I started doing research and I started listening and reading. And then I realized, you know, we're here to help each other. And if I don't speak out, if I don't serve my community by sharing my story and now on the other side of the bridge, right? with so much joy in my life, so much blessings. I mean, if someone had told me a year ago that I was getting married in a couple of weeks, I'd laugh. I'd say that's impossible because I was in such a dark place. I wow. didn't like who I was being. I didn't like myself. I looked in right. the mirror, always found something wrong with me at that time. Right. Um, nothing I did was good enough. I remember there was a day, a couple days. Um, and it's so it's weird, but it's not weird to say this because I, I feel compassion for that person. I remember going to the gas station one day and, and I, my, my mind was so critical of me. It was trying to convince me that I couldn't even put gas in my car the right Mm. way. Mm. Interesting. There's, there's no wrong way to put gas in a car that I'm aware of. Like you put the pump in the car and that's right. Right. It goes, you know, like right. you can't mess that up. Right. So it was, it was a couple of situations like that where I thought to myself, something's wrong because my mind is not supporting me. It's not helping me function properly. Yeah. And I started to ask, what else am I not seeing properly? Like if I'm seeing this, you know, extreme, it wasn't even lack of self worth. It was like hatred towards the self. Hmm. Like I'm so upset at myself for allowing myself to be depressed and for allowing myself to not be serving, not be loving. And then now I see why, because I needed that depth of pain in order to change. Mm. And some people do medication, which I think for a lot of people is the way to go. And it's important. And I, I didn't just because I, I chose not to, but there was a point where I, I got to a point where I was willing to do anything and everything. Right. You know, it got scary. I mean, I've, I've spoken to a couple of friends who haven't seen me for years in the last few weeks. And, um, and they admitted, they said, we were worried about you because we didn't know if you would do something crazy. Right. You're going to hurt yourself or something that your mind will take over and the suffering. Yes. But did you ever experience this growing up or was this something completely new to you, this whole feeling? That's a good question. I think I did um, because I'm I'm very sensitive being, and so um, as I imagine, you know, a lot of maybe even your listeners are they're very sensitive people, and mm-hmm. I did feel like there was a big part of me growing up that I didn't feel I belonged, even though I had a lot of friends and people who know me would probably like balk at that because they'd say, mm-hmm. "Wow, you're such a positive person, and you always mm-hmm. seem so happy." and um, and I did, I, I did, I feel I was very lucky. I had a lot, I have an amazing life, a lot to be grateful for, but it was really hard to, to associate. And I remember I didn't feel depression at that time, but I remember there was times I felt angry, like really, really angry at mm-hmm. my life, at myself. And that was right before the first depressive episode. Mm-hmm. It was almost like I had to... And, and please forgive the analogy, but it was almost like I had to, when there's a demon inside. Oh yeah. To like pull it out. Exorcist, right. You have right. to pull up the exorcist, uh, the, yeah. the demon. Right. So I remember there was, and you know, to, for lack of, for in, in, in the essence of time, I remember there were several situations where I felt like if I look back as if it was a movie right now and I'm looking at the scene, mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't be able to recognize myself if I didn't know it was me because I was in such a dark and angry space of my beingness. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I didn't know why. I just knew I was angry. I knew right. I was mad at the world <clears throat> because I felt hopeless and I felt disempowered. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I think is the most empowering thing is when you feel that something is is not right or you feel unable to function, it's the most empowering thing you can do is ask for help. Right. It's not it's, weakness. It's not weakness at all. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was for me, that was the huge lesson was the first time was I thought I was weak. I didn't want to tell anybody. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to ask for help. And by the grace of God, I was able to, it went away mm-hmm. and I was grateful, but then it came back and I mm-hmm. thought, well, why is this happening again then? Right. I could no longer accept that it was just going to go away. And I kept asking, like I had a couple of, I call them earth angels. 
and they come, you know, I, I call them earth angels because they come in different forms. Sometimes right. they're friends, sometimes they're doctors, sometimes they're therapists, a new playmate, a new friend, whatever it is, you know, mm-hmm. and a new job, you know, right. they're, they're experiences that help you, helped me get from step one to step two. And uh, there's a really cool quote that I love by Martin Luther King. And it's you, I I might be saying it a little bit wrong, but it's basically, you don't have to see the whole staircase. You just need to see the first step Mm -hmm. or take the first step. That's very correct with mental health healing. It's so hard to take that first step, but that first step is the beginning of the healing. That's crucial. And then you take another step and another step. If we saw the staircase, the staircase is so high, we would probably give up. Exactly. And, and I think, and this is where, you know, for me, like I, I say, I have to turn it over all the time, right? I surrender Mm -hmm. because there's only so much I can control. You know, it was when I, when I came to that realization, when I got on my knees finally, and I said, okay, God, like you show me the way, right? Because what I'm doing is not working. Mm -hmm. You know, I was exercising. I changed the way I was eating. I was trying to get back on my mat. Mm -hmm. Um, and I remember the first time (laughs) it was, it's not funny. It's actually, it was like really disturbing. I remember the first time when the first episode happened and I was in a yoga class and I remember like yoga was like my, my safe place, you know, I would Mm -hmm. get on my yoga mat and all my problems would go away, even if it was just for 20 minutes or an Mm -hmm. hour, whatever the class was. And that's one of the reasons I became a yoga teacher, um, because it did so much for me. So here I was like, you know, my, at that moment, my medicine, quote unquote, I'm on my yoga mat and I start to hear these negative voices in my head Mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you came to my yoga. They came to my my safe. Yeah. They found, they, they found my safe place. Right. And I thought, holy cow. Like, and and I really did think something was wrong with me. Like I thought I was like schizophrenic or I thought like something was off, you know? And then I realized through study, through questions, through talking to professionals, everyone's got their little voice, mm-hmm. right? And we have, I believe we have different levels of voices, the little quiet one that energetically feels very light and airy is our intuition. Mm-hmm. And it's not always light in the sense of um, when I say light, I don't mean not so intrusive. Yeah. Well, sometimes it is intrusive, um, but it's, it's not, when I say weight, I don't mean weight in the sense of like uh, strength of like lifting weights. Mm-hmm. Pounds. It's more of a, f- like a frequency. If it feels like love, like if somebody says, how do you know when you're in love? You just know. Right. Right. Parents, I get that question all the time. Their children ask them, how do I know if I'm in love? Right. No, it's a feeling. It's the same thing with intuition. And there's so many times in our lives where I think we, I ignored my intuition because I felt that I should know better or I was embarrassed about whatever I thought I should be doing. Like one of the things, and I appreciate what you shared in the opening of today um, of our time together was you said so many times we do what we think we should do, not what we want to do. Mm-hmm. Right. Because there's a perception of who we should be. Right. And the truth is, is, you know, depression can be a gift and it can really be, if a person wants it to be, it can be a force of, um, awakening mm-hmm. and, a, and a form of not just introspection in the sense of like reflection, but it can be a tra- change maker for the world. Like, look, you're, you're have a podcast. Mm-hmm because of this topic, right? Right. And there's so many people suffering right now and they don't realize that they have a choice. Mm -hmm. And it's okay if you wake up one day and you decide, listen, you know what? I don't want to be in a good mood today. Mm -hmm. I want to feel crappy. I want to, like my one of my teachers used to say, I want to have a pity party. So what I did, thank thank God to my coach at the time, her name is Nicole um, and she's amazing. She helped me give gratitude to the depression Mm -hmm. and she helped me make friends with it and become really familiar with this Mm -hmm. personality. Instead of running away from it, living with it, like you said before. Yeah. Like it it became a very um, familiar friend, Mm -hmm. which I didn't like the friend, right? It's not a friend that I was like, Oh, I can't wait for for (laughs) dinner. He was like, Oh my God, Susie's coming over for dinner. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And then I started to become like familiar with this feeling. And then I realized, wait, if I could become friends with this or maybe not Mm -hmm. friends, I could become familiar with it. 
I could probably start to change it. Now, when something shows up and let's say I'm uncomfortable or something happens, because life happens, right? Stuff's always going to happen. The situations don't change necessarily. It's the feeling and how we relate to them that change. Mm -hmm. So my parents getting sick didn't change. My sister's relationship and I didn't change while I was sick. Um, and I, and I say while I was sick, because I had to give myself permission to treat it like a sickness. Otherwise, it is, it is a sickness. Like our mind, it, it, our mind is sick. Our mind is not well. Totally. Like there's, there's a grade of how sick it is, but it does, it is not well. It's not serving us well when we're in depression. It's not producive. So I think it is a word and maybe people, like you said before, you were embarrassed to feel bad. They were feeling this way because your mother was suffering with cancer, but we need to treat it like cancer because it's just as bad as the suffering is so bad. It's different bad, but they're, it's bad and we shouldn't minimize it. And it is really, really a struggle like getting chemo. It's a struggle. And the, and the truth is, is, you know, when I started to witness myself going through it and I could almost detach from Mm -hmm. my experience, from my suffering, Mm -hmm. that's when I was able, because what happens is when someone's going through it and I'm not a professional, I'm not a doctor, so Mm -hmm. I can't by any means claim that I know what's going on. I just know for me, when I was able to witness as a observer what was going on i could only do that when i detached from my suffering like i had Mm -hmm. to get help in order to step away from the situation Mm -hmm. typically be able to almost like a like an eagle like observe from outside okay what do we do okay let's let's take care of the of the thing like if somebody has a scab Mm -hmm. or they cut themselves right we're gonna band-aid it we're gonna put some alcohol on it we sterilize the area clean it up and then we care for it so the mind and that's what makes it so challenging we don't see the wound so we don't think that there's a wound so when someone says no i'm fine i'm not suffering i don't have depression i'm okay but then they go home and they want to kill themselves because the the dinner wasn't ready in five minutes or the doctor um you know appointment was late or their traffic jam all these little things that are triggers I mean, I remember little, little things that I was off the handle. Like I was like, I can't handle life. Somebody would tell me something like, like I'm in sales, right? Like I was selling real estate, you know, for many years. So real estate is all about sales. It's all about contracts and deadlines. And Mm -hmm. I remember I have a pretty thick skin, right? I'm sensitive, but I've always been kind of a tough cookie Mm -hmm. in a lot of senses. So here I was, things that used to be really simple for me, all Mm -hmm. of a sudden came hard. Yes, that's such a big, big aspect of of realizing that something's going on. Sometimes people don't really know that they're depressed or they don't know because it's it's new to them. Everything's going regular and then they're hitting a wall and they're like, wait, it used to be really easy for me to wash the dishes. It was really easy for me to straighten up the, the house. It was really easy for me to write this paper. It was really easy for me to listen to something. It was really easy for me to go through a yoga class. It was like it was easy for me to get up in the morning and start my day. And then it becomes so, so difficult. And that's like a sign of something that's starting this mental health issue process and could be aware of and to be okay with it and not be so frustrated with it, like to to not fight it and to embrace it. Um, and when uh, I said this a few times on my podcast and my yoga teacher, Davira, that which I adore, and she was my salvation. I used to go to her class. I used to be, I was a seven day a week yoga goer because it wow. was my, it was my safe place. Like there was no day without yoga. And she used to tell me, stop running away with, from it, be with it, just feel it let it be. And when it starts being, you will get the knowledge of how to get rid of it. It's trying to teach you something and trying to tell you something. So when you run away from it, it's never going to catch up with you enough to teach you what you need to learn. You have to be with it and feel it in order to be able to move away from it. And I think that was one of the most powerful lessons I got from my, from my teacher. It was there to teach me something and to grow with it to grow with it. And it was such a, and I used to say to her, but I don't want to feel it. I don't want to feel it. I want to just get rid of it. I just want a pill to just that it should disappear. I can't, I can't. And she used to say to me, you could, the moment you will feel to your core, 
like you said, like the, the, the bricks on your heart, like you just, you couldn't breathe to feel to your core. That's when the, the, it starts to appear things, the right people come into your life to help you the right mindset, the right strategies. I, I really believe that that is the beginning of the journey of healing. If we want to go through it. Now, going through healing is such a painful process, such a hard process. It's not something that overnight, and sometimes you take so many steps forward and then we feel like we went all the way back and like we're, we feel so hopeless and like, how can we do this again? I'm tired, I'm fatigued. But we have to remind ourselves that this is part of it. And if we want to get to the other side, you got to do the work. You got to do the work. There's no way out. You've got to do the work. So what I want to ask you is, what were tips that helped you through? So you had this coach. What else helped you get out of the, the rot, the depression and get to where you are now getting married in a few weeks and you're vibrating phenomenally. You're happy. You're excited. Even though your father's not well, there's a lot of hardship in your life now. There's a lot of pain also, but you're showing up with a full heart, with gratitude. So what are tips that you got through your journey to help you heal? Yeah. And, and there's so many nuggets that you just shared. I mean, your teacher is so wise, right? And, mm -hmm. and how beautiful that now you get to share the torch mm -hmm. and share the message because it's true. If you don't feel it, you don't transform it. Mm -hmm. And the some of the tips and the turning points for me were accepting help was huge because help shows up in ways that we don't know. Like there's a saying, we don't know. Some, sometimes we don't get what we want, but we get what we need. Mm. And I've been blessed. I find that the more I allow my life to bring me what I need, I end mm. up getting what I want. <laughs> I yeah. just, it's so funny because I just had this conversation right before I was, I started the call with you. And I just <laughs> had this conversation that it's not about no's. It's, a, I'm, we're not the universe, God, whatever, the energy, whatever we're asking for is not saying no. They might be saying we have something else, better, different. Exactly. Yeah. And when we see it that way, it's so much easier to deal with it. Yeah. It's, and, and that was huge, right? Still, like even today, like, you know, I'm planning a wedding and I'm like, it's so funny because even before our call, I was getting input from a couple people on different things because I want people to feel their, their input matters. Right. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's like, I have to do at the end of the day, what's best for my fiance and I for the wedding. Absolutely. And I thought to myself, you know, it's, it's almost funny, comical, how, how we're all in this. I, and I'm, you know, I'm a humanitarian. I'm an Aquarius. I love doing like community, right? Like I'm right. a big community person. Right. And I remember when I was in that state of, just confusion and doubt and lack and pain and suffering, mm -hmm. all the negative things, all the bottom of the, of the line, we'll call mm -hmm. it below the line. I wanted nothing to do with anybody. I wanted to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And in Kabbalah, which is a form of Judaism that I study, it talks about being, and I, I'm hoping it's okay I say this, sure. they say um, being with Satan. And mm -hmm. it basically just means you're giving your power away and, and, and there's a lot to it, but for simplicity reasons, when you, when I felt like my, I'm an, I'm usually an extrovert, right? I like my privacy and I like my space, but I'm, I'm very much in tune with community and people. So when I was the opposite, I knew something was wrong because I didn't want to be around people. Like mm -hmm. people annoyed me, even a stranger that I never met before. I didn't want to spend 10 seconds with them, the cashier at the gas station, because I was in such a discomfortable, the uncomfortable space in myself mm -hmm. and in my skin that nobody made me happy. When someone is going through the pain of depression or in that suffering, I invite them. I invite you to ask, like you said, what is this for? Why is this happening? And where in me can I grow? Because truthfully, if there's a certain pattern and, and there's things that you've liked most of your life and you have passion for, if you like music or you like books or you like cooking, and then all of a sudden you start to notice, I don't like cooking anymore. Oh, and I don't like going to the movies anymore. Oh, and I used to love music, but I don't like music anymore. There could be something going on. Very, very, very subtle. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's changes, drastic, not drastic, but subtle changes that add up over time. Like you said, somebody might not even realize that they're in depression. Mm -hmm. So like for me, it was being in community. I really like being around people because I feel that we're here to serve and support each other. 
Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean I want to be around people 24 seven because I need my space mm-hmm. and I'm very energetic and I can feel things. So I feel like being around people is really important, especially people that you trust. Mm-hmm. So finding a support group, finding a friend, finding five friends, mm-hmm. you know, when I remember I, I'm a very, um, n- most people would say I'm a social person. And I remember when I was going through it, I literally remember my head telling me, you don't have any friends. Nobody no. likes you. You're boring. Right. And I was like, maybe I am boring, but wow. that doesn't mean I don't have any friends. And I was almost like mad at that part of me mm-hmm. because I was like, who, who are you talking to? Mm-hmm. But then I remembered that's, that, that was the defining moment because it was like, you have to disassociate from the depression to realize that you're in a depression or something's going on because when you're in it, you're one with it. It's like you're, you have to almost be one with it and then split from it. So how did you do that? So for me, definitely first was exercise. I noticed that when I was moving, when I was exercising, I felt better. So even if it was, it was really hard for me. Like I I don't like exercising. I'm not like one of these, you know, gym, gym rats. Um, But I do like fitness. I like to be healthy. So I would focus on my medicine. My mental medicine was exercise. Mm Mm-hmm. So even if it was 30 minutes a day or 15 minutes a day, I forced myself to go for a walk. I forced myself to make a, a phone call to a friend. Even when and you were depleted, when you were depleted, when depleted. you got yeah. yourself out there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I started to, on the times when it was really, really, really hard, that's when I leaned on other people. And so I created for myself like a, um, with the help of others, right? Because I didn't realize what I was doing until mm-hmm. I spoke about it there were because there was times I didn't want to go and I was like no it's fine and then 24 hours would go by and I'd be like you know the next day oh my god I didn't even get out of bed today Mm -hmm. that was weird for me like that's not my norm so unless I'm sick or have a cold or something I would like to take this opportunity to pause for a second and give a big thank you to our sponsor, BetterHelp.com. Have you been thinking of getting therapy for a while, but you live in a place that doesn't have therapists that meets your need? Or are they too expensive for what you can afford and you really want to get help and therapy? Or do you travel a lot and you can't access the therapist when you travel? Or do you come home from work and you're too it's too late to go to an office for therapy? Well, BetterHelp.com is an online platform for therapy. You can access thousands of therapists and choose from the therapist that meets your need. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com forward slash hope to recharge to receive your 10% off on your first month. Take charge of your wellness. Go try them out. They really try hard to match you up with the specific therapist that will meet your need. Don't wait to get help. Go now, betterhelp.com forward slash hope to recharge. You can access them from your phone, your tablet, your computer. You can be in your bed and you can receive your therapy you need. Don't wait longer. I started to like army myself with people that I trusted. So the first person was a coach, which was really hard because I mean, that was like hundreds of dollars a month Mm -hmm. (laughs) that I didn't have. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, Regina, if you want to get out of this alive, you better find the money. Yeah. Because this is no laughing matter anymore. Like right. thinking about suicide is not a joke. Right. And I said, okay, that's enough. And mm-hmm. there was a couple moments. And me- meanwhile, I'm a speaker. So I remember there was a specific day, and I've written about this day, where I had that thought two days before the event that I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this anymore. I'm mm-hmm. too tired. I'm not good at life. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter what I do, my life sucks. These are all the mm-hmm. things in my head was saying. And uh, what's the point? Like all these just ratty things. And it was like, like stinky gar- garbage. Mm-hmm. You don't, when you don't take the garbage out, the trash mm-hmm. starts. To mm-hmm. So it was all these stinky thoughts. Mm-hmm. So I remember I had to decide if I was going to go to the event or not. And I was speaking at the event. I was a panelist. And I remember saying to myself, if I don't go to this event, I'm going to get stuck here. Right. Here meaning this mental state. Right. And it had already been 10 months. Mm. So I said to myself, Regina, you have a choice. You can either stay in bed mm-hmm. on the morning that I, I woke up. I remember it was like 8, 8.05 or 8.03, something like that. I looked at the clock mm-hmm. and I had a thought. And it was, if you stay in this bed, you're going to stay in this state for, for a while. I think it's amazing that you had that clarity. 
because usually when we're in that state, we convince ourselves that it's just for the day and tomorrow we'll get up because the thought of it lasting too long is too painful. So we convince ourselves it's okay to stay just today and then it's another just tomorrow. I'm, I'm very into giving ourselves what we need and pampering and times out. But where you were, it, it sounded like it was a constant state that wasn't cha changing and you caught that moment and said no more, which is so strong. Yeah. And it's, and you brought up a really good point. It's also, um, and I, and this is where my coach helped me a lot because I was beating myself up. Like mm -hmm. I was angry at myself for being angry at myself. So it was right. like this spiral and how do you get out right. of that circle when you're in right. it? Right. So, my coach was really helpful in helping me associate and then disassociate with the depression. And then when it was healthy, when I was healthier, by that point, I think I, I was starting to look into therapy. Um, the turning point was then getting the support and, and creating like a, almost like a blanket mm -hmm. of support so that people can help you help when you have those negative thoughts, right. because it was, it's a fine balance between beating yourself up and not doing enough. Right. Like the pampering is really important because when you're beating yourself up, you might not even have any physical activity, but it's a mental beat up and yes. you're exhausted after right. 20 minutes because right. you feel like you've been in the ring for four hours. Absolutely. You right. know, so it's a very mental thing. It's not physical, which is why it's so hard for people to change because they don't see what's going on. So I think it's really, really, really important to ask for help and receive the help when it shows up. And incubate yourself in a blanket of love, whether it's a church, whether it's a synagogue, whether it's, it might not even be anything to do with spirituality, which I believe it has a lot to do with spirituality, but a support could, system. And yeah. Whatever some type it is. Of support system. It could be a 12 step. It could be, you know, you like to knit. So you go to a knitting club, right? You know, right. it could be baseball, it could be football, it could be whatever makes you get out of bed in the morning. That's what you need to do. And speak up because at the end of the day, nobody can. And, and it's like you said, if somebody wants help, they'll get it. But if they don't want the help, they're not going to get it. And it took me months. It took me probably five months, six months before I admitted that I was suffering because the mm -hmm. first few months in some way, I guess it was serving me. Right. You know, and that's something that my coach really helped me with was asking myself, okay, how does this serve me? And mm -hmm. at first I was like insulted by the question. <laughs> Like, what do you mean? I'm sick. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what do you mean? I'm, I'm, I have this depression and, and mm -hmm. why would I ask for this? And why would somebody want this? Well, so what was that real turning point? So you got the coach, you got the support of your friends, that blanket of love of whoever's going to be there when you want to not show up. You did your exercise. Was there something else that really you, you could say, this is what was the turning point that, that shifted me and I, and I, and I was able to, to heal. Do you call yourself a healed person? I feel um, we're always healing. You know, anybody who's alive, who's standing and um, on planet Earth has healing to do. Mm -hmm. Even enlightened people, right. you know, like some of my teachers, my gurus, they're not fully 100% over. They're not like totally right. healed. Like they 100%. Have to work on. Yeah. Right. It allows me comfort and knowing like we're all in this journey together and but you're not in a depressive state right now. No, not at all. And and I think for me the the main turning point was I mean don't get me wrong I still have moments, right? Like mm -hmm. if someone's listening it doesn't mean that I'm saying I never get depressed. I have mm -hmm. moments where I'm sad. I have a lot of moments where I'm sad, where I feel the sadness of what's going on in the world and I see the sadness of what's happening in my family and mm -hmm. you know life has reality to it, right? Like it's real life and we but have- But it's real not situation. a depressive state. Right. It's not like I walk around with a cloud over my head. Right. And for me, the turning point was knowing that this was happening for me mm -hmm. instead of, because mm -hmm. that was the, the defining factor because it's, it's really a choice. Like I could still create that story in my head that, you know, my life is crazy and miserable and mm -hmm. that- I'm not doing anything and I'm, you know, my life is whatever, because we're always able to compare to someone who has something more of what we want, right? They might have bigger car, bigger house, bigger ring, bigger uh, network, bigger right. or smaller, right? Some people want smaller, right? If you go into the villages of India and the mm -hmm. people are smiling and they have two teeth, mm -hmm. they might look at us and say, you know what? You have too many teeth. 
<laughs> right? I like my two teeth, you know, right, or I right. want, you know what I mean? Right, like, right. and that's where I realized, like, for me to compare, and I, and I think in our society, in America especially, and I know your, um, your listeners, are, I'm guessing, from all over the world, yeah. one of the things that I think that's really key and important is not to compare to other people. Crucial, crucial. Because this is where the depression for me came from, was I was looking on Facebook, I was looking on social media, mm. I could see my friends had this, or the person I thought mm. that... I looked up to, right, at that time, it looked like had more than I did. Mm. And I guarantee you, just like I know because I even, you know, in the last couple of days, people say, oh, you, you know, you look so this, you look so that, like, it's so amazing what's happening. They don't know what's going on in the background. Right, right. You know, they, they don't know what it takes for you to get on this call every week. Right. And Absolutely. how many buttons we have to push and how much you know, attention you have to give and how you might be having a bad day, but you Absolutely. start, yeah. you know, and, and I just think that the more compassion that we can have for each other as humans, the more we can serve and support each other, because at the end of the day, we can learn from each other. Right. And we can learn from depression. We can learn from suffering. You know, I just want to stop you for a second. And I want to bring a thought to what you said to comparing. And my husband taught me something so, so beautiful. And he lives this. He really lives this from the day I, I, I met him. When he sees people with something that he would dream of, an abundance, a family that he never had, like whatever it is, phenomenal life. He gets excited. He literally gets excited. And he's like, it's so awesome to know that I live in a world that people have X, Y, and Z. It's just exciting. It's just exciting. And it invites him to know that if one can have something special like that, he can have whatever his dream, whatever is special for him. There is no jealousy factor, none whatsoever. It's an excitement factor. I am so excited to live in a world that I could see this tremendous amount of whatever it is, whatever it is in that moment that he's observing. Like, And he really gets excited about it. And it's not a mind twister at all. He really gets excited that people have whatever they're having. And it's so awesome. It could be something that he's not even in the mood, like something they never dreamt of. But if someone is excited, let's say to show off uh, a yacht or an airplane or a great vacation or a great or whatever it is. And it's not something that he ever had a dream for. But the fact that they're excited about something great that they have, he's like, that's fabulous. This is so awesome that people have this. And he seems like a, an amazing human. He really, he really works on ways to, to be present and to make the most of whatever brings him. And the jealousy factor is just not there for him. It's just not. Yeah. And it's, it's so beautiful because I really feel that's the essence, right? It's like living in this very, almost like curious childlike state mm -hmm. of euphoria. And I, I feel, you know, I don't want to brag about it because that's not always the case, but I feel like so grateful to hear that because in the moments when I'm that, which are more frequent now, Mm -hmm. The moments when I do feel the opposite, which is the contrast, right? When I feel the depression or I feel the, the sadness creep in or I feel the doubt or whatever, I can say thank you to that. I can say mm -hmm. thank you now to the doubt. And I can say thank you for showing up because you helped remind me of the opposite. Mm -hmm. yes. Because I don't want to live there. I don't want to live in the dark place. I don't want to mm -hmm. live in the in the negativity and the right. darkness. I mean, the way your husband lives is such a blessing. And, yeah. and it's the... It's, it's a true mitzvah to be living in that place of joy and fulfillment because really nothing is guaranteed. Like all we have is this moment. Right. And right. I think to myself, would I rather be sitting? And I, you know, I had to ask myself when I was conscious of it, which wasn't always, but towards the end of my, you know, my um, long stretch, I say, of the suffering, that's what helped me was I was asking myself, how long do you want to feel this way? Like I kept saying, oh, I feel like this, I feel like this. And in the beginning, people were saying, just shake it off. Mm -hmm. And and then I remember towards the end, I realized it had I had to almost like in order to, and again, it's like being able to see outside of it. I started to ask myself like curiously, okay, you don't feel well today. I see. I understand. Okay. So how do you want to feel? Mm -hmm. And I just, in the, in the, you know, it's, it's kind of like doing it backwards, like reverse, like that's right. what the therapy was helping was, you know, asking, and now I do this for other people. Okay. You don't feel good. I get it. Oh, got it. Okay. You feel like this, 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 and this. So how do you want to feel? Mm -hmm. And what do you, what do you think we need to do to get you to feel that? 
Right. Because if right. you don't know what's going on, you can't change it. Right. So like right now, it's really funny. My um, partner and I, my fiance, we have this game that we play, like we're getting to know each other. Right. And so it, it takes a while sometimes to get to know someone. So we're very fortunate because we both are learning to play the game mm-hmm. and treat it like a game. So like every couple, we have stuff that shows up, you know, it's right. small, small things. It could be anything stupid. Like, why did you put the fork there? Right. Because I like it in that drawer. Oh, right. okay. I don't like it in that drawer. I want it in the other drawer. Right. So whatever it is, right. when something shows up, we, we say, oh, that's a trigger. Mm-hmm. And now we thank the trigger and we, we give gratitude to the thing for showing up. For teaching you. For teaching us. Exactly. And there is a beautiful Hawaiian prayer called Ho'opo'opo'opona. Eh, I'm saying it wrong. Ho'opo'opo'opona. And, Ho'opo'opo'opona. Um, <laughs> I can't even say it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very funny um, word. And basically all it is, is a mantra. And it's mm-hmm. these four words. It's, I love you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And thank you. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter what order you, you say it in, mm-hmm. but you say these four phrases. And sometimes you can even say one phrase. I love you. 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. So you can do any order. You can do any combination. But the whole concept of Ho'opo'opo'opona is that you clean whatever it is that is bringing you pain. This was a really powerful tool. And this is something I'd love to gift, you know, your listeners, anybody that um, would like some support and would like to connect. I'd love to be able to offer some of the tools that I've used and I still use. Like mm-hmm. Ho'opo'opona ona is like a, um, it's kind of like a broom. So Nice. In some way, it's wonderful because it cleans it up. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like a broom that cleans the floor. Mm-hmm. Now, anyone that guarantees you that you'll never have to clean the floor again is lying. Is lying. Because <laughs> you're going to have to clean the floor. Right. Right. You got to brush your teeth every day. You got to right. clean the floor. Right. And so when I stopped fighting the theory that I was going to have to do it, when I stopped fighting the idea that energetically, would not have to deal with depression anymore. Mm-hmm. It didn't become an issue anymore. Like if it happens, it'll happen and I'll deal with it when it happens. The fear, the fear of it showing up was holding you back from actually um, healing. But when we know yeah. that it's there, it might show up and we'll deal with it when it comes is yeah. the, I call it the exhale. It's like, okay, fine. Now you can breathe out, like let it out. It's okay. It will be okay. Totally. And yeah. it, it's like a monster under the bed, right? When we're little, Mm-hmm. And you know, or sometimes we're adults and we still have monsters under the bed, right? right. Like when we are afraid of something, we right. give it so much more power than maybe it's even necessary. Right. So yeah. when we can talk about mental health and suicide and depression, and we can just talk about it, like it's depression, right. not like it's this scary monster in the room because right. it is scary, but it doesn't have to be scary. The more secretive it is, you know, it the more it's scary. Right. Exactly. The, the stigma that you talk about and the taboo about it and, and the idea that there's something shameful about it, mm-hmm. that's what makes it heavy. It's not right. the thing. It's not depression that's heavy. It's just a word. It's right. the emotion we put to it. So, you know, for, for anyone listening, like I really, I'm so happy that Matana is here and that you have a resource because she's amazing. And she, I love the, the people that you have on because they are so authentic and they Thank give you. their experience. And, you know, this work is really, we need each other. And now when I hear about all the children and the teens that are yes. doing this, it, it made me wake up and right. it made me realize it's time to talk about it because this is our future. These young adults who have these crazy pressures today, like they, we didn't have that. I mean, we didn't have social media to compete with when we were teens. Right, right. Absolutely. You know, I, I hear of some of the things that I'm, I'm hearing from my friends who have kids and I'm like, no wonder the kids are suffering and the kids right. are struggling because they think that they're doing something wrong when in reality, they're just trying to be teens. Right. Just to live, but they can, they're, they're constantly on a race, a race to improve themselves to others and show up in a way that they're not like, they're sh- not show they're showing up with the name that people put to them, not what they want to make their name. Like you made your own name, created yeah. your own you and who you want to be. I want to talk about your internal peace now. What can people find there? Great question. Thank you for asking. So Internal Peace Now is the um, the name of my, I guess you could say movement. Um, mm-hmm. It's the name of my website, but it's also the way that I 
invite people to embrace life mm -hmm. and have peace in their hearts. Mm -hmm. And uh, not tomorrow, not a month from now, no. not six months or six years, but now. Mm -hmm. you know, choose, choose peace, internal peace now. Mm -hmm. Because when, when we can live in a peaceful place, in a mental peaceful place, everything is better. Right. It doesn't matter how much money we have. I meet wealthy people that are depressed and I meet not so wealthy people that are depressed. Right. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Right. It doesn't matter how big of a home you have. It, it matters how much love you have in your heart. And, uh, and so when people come to me, you know, the thing that I like to work on the most is self-love mm -hmm. because I feel that without self-love, we can't love others 100%. when we don't love ourselves. Step one. That's step right. one. I believe that it is a step one in everything. And also when we love ourselves, we don't judge ourselves and we are easy with telling people what our struggles are because we love who we are and we're okay with it, which is an easy thing to say, but not so easy to do, especially when we're in darkness, but it's, it, it's definitely a tool. So you gave us a ton of knowledge. It was your coach that helped you that I feel like you probably feel like an abundance of gratitude and you owe her your life. And she sounds remarkable. Your exercise, what is this serving me? How is this? What was this depression? Not why did it come to me? For what? What did it come to serve me and teach me? And the self love, self love and surround yourself with support that when you don't have that courage to show up. They won't judge you and they will be there for you and they will do what you need to, to show up for yourself and be true to yourself. To tr be true to yourself to what you need and be okay with whatever you need in order to heal. And no two journeys are the same. No two journeys are the same. And talk, talk, talk about it. Now, I don't, as we, I always say, not talking to anybody, find the pe right people to talk to. But there are enough forums, enough groups, enough support, enough friends that know what you're talking about and they'll be okay with it that will support you. Don't find the ones that will tell you brush it off because that's not helpful. That's really not helpful. Is there anything else you want to share before we say goodbye? There is one um, and it's a little advanced, but I think for those that are ready uh, to really, 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 really change for those that might be listening and who really might be going through something heavy and they really want the support and to grow um, out of this, I invite you to ask forgiveness of yourself mm, because yeah. that's huge. And, um, and to really give yourself permission mm. to, to be happy again. Yeah. Because there's a lot of guilt of the the years, time that what that we feel that we were in darkness. So forgive ourselves for not being who we wanted to be, and 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 talking to ourselves like we're our best friend and saying it's okay. You did your best you can. You showed up yeah. as much as you can. Yeah, forgiveness to ourselves is key. Just like self acceptance, it's like related. When you forgive, forgive yourself. What comes before? I think it's forgiveness. When you forgive yourself, you love yourself, you nurture yourself, you accept yourself, and then everything after that, you know. Where to go in order to heal. And it's just a, a specific calling. Regina, what does hope mean to you? Mm. Hope to me, that's such a great one. Hope means what's next. Mm, nice. What's next? Nice. Very, very nice. So yeah. simple, but so deep. Yes. What's next? Wow. This was such a lesson of... Um, a roller coaster of life, mm. really a lesson of hope, living life and learning from life, not only living, but learning and adapting and changing and serving. And now Regina serves others and she's there for others with her teachings, with her support. I'm so honored to be able to have spoken to you and her, hear your story. And I, I want to wish your father a huge recovery and he should not suffer and seeing the suffer is so hard and you should be able to see him in a happy state, in a healthy state. And to all those out there suffering. So really, I want to send a prayer to him. And um, thank you for sharing your journey, your story, your hope with my community. If anybody wants to connect with Regina or ask her specific stories about her journey, I'm I'm assuming that it's on your website. Yeah. And actually, there's... Um, and thank you so much for not just the prayers, but the opportunity to be here, to be with your community and with you connect mm -hmm. and um, a great way to reach me is um, we all use our cell phones nowadays mm -hmm. on the cell phone you could um, text me for those that are listening you can text me the word yoga to the number six four six 
zero zero. Oh, it's just such a short number. Yeah. So, so repeat it again. Sure. So you text the number six four six zero zero. Uh huh. And you uh, text the word yoga. Interesting. What is yeah. that? What is that texting thing? Um, is it a specific number you buy for like a hashtag? Um, it's actually it's super cool, and I can tell you more about it. Um, definitely offline too. It's it's an amazing tool that I've mm -hmm. been really honored to be part of. It's a company called Easy Card, mm -hmm. and it's a virtual. I basically it's like a mobile website. Interesting. Very nice. So it's really cool. And uh, anybody who has a business. Um, or a service can use it. We have, you know, we're actually funny enough. We're going to, instead of doing, um, wedding invitations, we're going to do an easy card invitation. Cool. So, like our story and everything about who we are and our wedding information is going to be on the, on the website, the mobile website. Very interesting. Okay, cool. Well, we learned something new every single day and I definitely yes. learned a lot now. So guys, thank you for listening. For all my amazing listeners, thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining our community. Thank you for allowing us to break the stigma together because in mental health together is better. We will share stories and we'll break the stigma one story at a time. And I really believe that from every story, we learned something. One tip. It's not like one will solve our problems, but we can bring tips into our world and try something. And if it doesn't work, try something else. But we could definitely inspire ourselves to keep on trying and keep on fighting the fight of mental illness and create a better wellness for ourselves. So you can find us on hope to recharge.com or you can find us on Hope to Recharge Facebook community where we talk about different inspiration, thoughts, or just practical life struggles and overcoming it. So you can join the conversation there. We would love to hear your thoughts. Thank you again for being here. Bye till next time. Thank you for joining us and taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Please hit the subscribe button so you can hear further episodes. If you are listening to us on iTunes, please leave feedback and ratings below. Let us know if there's any topic that you would like to hear from us in the future. Bye till next time.